You're now listening to Binge Brew Brain Podcast, the show that teaches simple neuroscience-based strategies to ending overeating, binge eating, emotional eating, and yo-yo dieting. I'm Natalia, your host, and I'm here to help you create wellness without the obsession. Let's get started. Hello, everybody. The guest on today's episode has an incredible story to share. Her first binge eating episode happened in a year 1983. And if you do the math, it means almost four decades of struggle with binge eating and bulimia. Frances is a new graduate of a Binge Pro Brain coaching program, and she accepted my invitation to be on this show to share uh, what she tried in the past to heal and what was a real game changer for her. Her story will surely inspire you to choose a different path and finally get get out of a binge and purge cycle. I share success stories on the podcast because I want to help you believe that no matter how long you've been battling with an eating disorder, you can change. And Frances is a great example of how quickly your life can transform if instead of focusing on just food, you focus on rewiring your brain. So Frances, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much. I I want to say that um, in my 12-step programs that I've been in um, for over two decades, I'm known as Franny. Um, uh, I am Franny, uh, known as Franny K, and I am from the East Coast of uh, the U.S. And I'm really um, grateful that I found Natalia, yes. Yeah, we are very excited to have you on. So let's begin right away. Why don't you start with telling us all about your background, you know, your relationship with food, your body, what kind of eating disorders you struggled with for how long? Just paint a picture for us. The big picture is that um, in the early 1980s, I was struggling with, you know, trying to fit in with the crowd. I was in healthcare at a big uh, teaching hospital with a lot of level one head trauma, if anybody knows what that is. And, uh, uh, and I was a little young to accept the life and death that was in front of me every day. And I found out a, whole, a really, really uh, deep family secret. So up until uh, April of 1983, I don't remember um, using food in in a an a abnormal way. But starting um, at that point in my life, I started um, using food, and then I would feel guilty because I didn't want to get fat. So I was, uh, I became a slave to using um, food and or alcohol to soothe myself, all the while being externally um, what other people might call successful. I had friends, I had a great job, everything was moving along. And, uh, you know, how do I get four decades in just a few minutes? My life has been bubble, I'm the bubbly one, the cheerleader. Um, I have, been married to the same man for 34 years. Um, I have uh, three um, grown children that are, you know, very independent. I will say this though, I always identified as a bulimic. I did go see my first therapist, like within a few months of me um, starting the binge purge cycle. And then four years into uh, my uh, bulimia, I met my husband and like on our second date, I told him about my bulimia because I identified as that's what I was. And the reason I say that is because that's a common thread that I have kept up until working with, um, you know, Binge Proof Brain, the program, because the 80% of me, the 85% of me that was accomplished and successful and uh, everything was really, really good in my life, except I had this deep dark secret, but that deep, dark secret was my ball and chain that I carried in my heart, on my brain, in my soul. And um, I have been pursuing um, recovery uh, at least since 1998. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for for sharing your story. So obviously, uh, you've mentioned at the beginning that you spent a lot of time in 12 steps uh, programs. You went through them a couple of times. You had a multiple sponsors. So uh, could you make for us a short comparison of your experience uh, between years in Overeaters Anonymous versus three months uh, of coaching with me? Yes. And what I want to say about that is It is perhaps the reason that I was um, so ready and ripe to accept um, the Binge Proof Brain uh, program. But I will tell you that not only uh, was I active in the eating uh, 12-step program, but also alcohol. So when I put my alcohol, and I have been uh, sober for over 10 years, Um, but for an addict like me, but for someone like me, whose brain just goes into overdrive, um, which is what I have learned. Once I'm in that fight or flight, there's, I have to have something. So if I wasn't using alcohol, because of course I didn't want to be drunk and food is legal, food is easily available, yada, yada. So um, whenever my alcohol use went down, my bulimia would go up or when my bulimia had been calmed down for a little bit at a time, my alcohol use would go up. But anyway, that's just a little background. I have done the 12 steps in numerous, numerous times. I have had probably at least over two dozen sponsors in the eating 12 step program. I just don't want to um, break the tradition and um, use uh, the term because I do believe in the program. However, as many, uh, what we call fourth step, which is where you list your um, character defects and, you know, you do your inventory. Well, all that did was make me um, believe that I was flawed. Um, There was something that I was doing wrong. And I changed sponsors so many times because A, I would slip and um, get off of the recommended food plan. Or B, I was trying to do it the way that fit somebody else. And I have known, I have known, I have known for so many years, I've asked, uh, by the way, I've seen therapists all my life. And when I say all my life, of course, this is, you know, I've had uh, hills and valleys. I've told every one of my therapists and sponsors, if you did that functional MRI on my brain, you would see those areas light up. I just cannot control it. Uh, No matter how much I would tell myself I'm going to pick up the phone and call somebody. And I found Binge Proof Brain after my third one month treatment away from my family. And I came back and I lost my abstinence after being clean for 30 days in this environment. And I'm just so grateful that for me, It has just been very, very eye-opening. And in the 12-step programs, we do learn that we have a disease, okay? We have a disease. And I did accept that. But until learning what Natalia has taught me about the brain and the chemistry of the brain, and once some of that gets kicked into action, that is where the uncontrollable part of the disease comes. And I knew it because I lived it. I lived it. And uh, I will just say that this has worked for me. I'm glad that you've mentioned also that you were in the outpatient treatment. I totally forgot about it. But yes, indeed, a couple of months ago, you also took part in it. But uh, coming back to like 12 step programs. So in my opinion, you know, food addiction plans, 12 step programs, they work for so many people. And I don't want to say that these programs are wrong ways to approach eating disorder recovery. But clearly, those programs, they do not, they are not suitable for everyone. So if somebody feels real food freedom by abstaining from sugar and flour and by measuring their food, it's great. Problem appears when we believe that there is something wrong with us, that food food abstinence is the only right solution, but we keep failing at sticking to the program. And then we blame ourselves for lack of strength to, to stick to it. So when we started working together, you still attended some OA meetings, but at some point you stopped. I would like to know 
what stopped resonating with you in OA, what parts of OA approach didn't work for you, which parts you were tired of. And again, I think I'm speaking for both of us. We don't want to be disrespectful for all those people. You said that years in OA really helped you to get to where you are right now. But again, I just want to hear about your subjective experience. Thank you. My experience is that I tried so hard. It's like I tried too hard, but there was an element missing. There was just some link between what the 12 steps and I have total respect for Bill Wilson. I can, I can quote you the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, which is what um, OA is moving towards using the big book because uh, there are a lot of people who cannot get um, recovery from food addiction. And so in the past several, many years, um, there's a big movement to really, really get much, much more strict about the alcoholic foods. So just like alcohol affects, um, you know, back when this was written and what has helped millions and millions of people, the movement now is that absolutely identify your alcoholic foods and your alcoholic food behaviors. If you abstain from those, you can recover. And Many people on a a call that I've listened to probably five or six times a week, at least, this is with me driving to work, they call themselves recovered. And so the the more often that I picked up food and could not stay abstinent, the more it fueled that identity that I mentioned a few minutes ago, I'm a food addict, I'm a bulimic, I'll never be anything else. And so me letting go of what worked for everybody else and finally um, trying to go inside of myself, listening to myself. And Natalia, you've helped me when you've said there's nothing broken and I'm not broken. And all these years and all these hours and hours and journals, I have done so many fourth steps. I've done you know, fifth steps. I've uh, made amends to everybody I have harmed in the formal way. But even without uh, the formal way of the 12 steps, I am a good person. I'm a compassionate person. I work in healthcare. I'm, I inherently have the Holy Spirit inside of me, and I am not trying to get religious, but this is a spiritual release that I have um, felt since accepting that there are parts of my brain that were developed by my ancestors um, for survival. And I always come and I'm just going to jump to this real quick. Um, Just recently, you know, Natalia, you explained that even our ancestors, the cavemen compared themselves to one another because the survival of the fittest was the way it was. Well, I live in suburbia, USA, where we are, you know, middle class. People go on lavish vacations. The women have beautiful homes. They all go to the gym, you know, three, four, five days a week because, you know, everybody looks a certain way. So I know I live in a bubble, but I was constantly in my 30s and 40s and even in my 50s comparing myself, my husband, my cars, my vacations, my children, my children's grades. Anybody's accomplishments in my family, I was comparing to my neighbor. And that was just a very, uh, it took a lot of energy. It took a lot of energy. And, um, you know, again, I'm past menopause, so my hormones have changed also. But I'm just, I, I don't have to live that way anymore. And I was doing the comparison in OA. I would get people that came in after me and they would, you know, two years down the road or one year down the road, they'd have a year of uh, abstinence or recovery. And here I am 19, 20 years in, and I'm still, you know, on step, I'm on step one, I'm on step zero. I haven't admitted my powerlessness. For me, learning that the chemistry in my brain, and I might be different. I am not saying that Um, look at me, this is exactly the way you need to recover because I have learned so much about myself. And so I will 
ah, take a breath and hand that over to you. <laughs> yep, that was perfect. Thank you for mentioning, um, you know, the function of the brain. I think that we're going to come back to talking about brain specifically. Uh, but first, uh, quickly, I'm going to back to go back to uh, like food specifically uh, issues. But again, thank you so much for, for sharing your experience. I personally don't have that much personal experience with attending 12-step programs. So I'm very happy and gra- grateful that you wanted to share with us your experience. But coming back to the food. So for years, you've been writing down your food plan. You were measuring your food, sending it to your sponsor. I think that our listeners are dying to know how you transitioned to more relaxed approach to food. What has recently changed in regard to your diet and food choices? How do you eat now? Um, how do you make food decisions? Is it easier to stick to a program or is it easier to eat using your intuition and common sense? Uh, <laughs> all of the above, but I will, uh, let me just preface by saying that yes, I would write down my food, I would weigh and measure, and that would work for maybe a couple of weeks because, you know, I had uh, motivation and I was, you know, I I believed that this would work. Look, it works on my sponsor. And, you know, just to shout out if any of my sponsors ever listen to this, I am just very, very, very grateful for all the time and effort they, um, you know, supported me with. But I will say that uh, this is how I explain it to my non-food addicted, you know, I don't even want to use food addict, but people who don't understand those of us that have problems with food, I would explain to friends, you know, look, I would never, ever allow myself a serving of potato chips, but I would binge on three bags two weeks later or two months later, because it's that restriction that would backfire on me. You know, Natalia, you said it the other day in one of the, uh, recordings I was listening to, you know, holding that um, beach ball underwater, that ball underwater. I can only hold it for so long. So what do I do now? Sometimes I overeat. Sometimes I stress eat. But golly, my body actually takes care of itself. Because if I do stress eat or overeat, and I move away from the table or the kitchen And I start not analyzing, but thinking about, you know, what led me to this, you know, three, four, sometimes five hours later, my body has regulated itself because I haven't thought about eating because I have been so full from eating three servings of something instead of one. Um, And again, I've got four decades of this, so I don't expect, you know, if I'm 400 miles out that I'm going to make one turn and be back, uh, be where I want to be. But the freedom that I have felt in my soul and in my heart to be myself and trust myself and honor myself has been the biggest gift that, again, the um, and I literally spent probably 10 or 12 hours a week, if not more, working on my program. I had sponsors that wanted me to call them at 6 a.m. in the morning. Well, I would get up in the morning and, you know, I I would not fabricate, but embellish, you know, what I was saying. You know, how are you doing? They would say, you know, how are you doing? (laughs) And if I was going to be honest, I would have said, well, it's not fun to get up and call somebody at six in the morning. Anyway, uh, we'll just end that part by saying this. It's almost like, I don't know, we used to have a parakeet when I was a little girl and he would um, fly out of the cage and we'd have to go grab him um, from the top of the curtain uh, where he was perched. And so when you grab the little bird, the tighter you hold the little bird, the more they struggle. But if you loosen the, the grip on the little bird, then they relax a little bit. And so I believe that and I am a high achiever, You meaning I'm a responsible adult, okay? I'm no different than probably most of the, a lot of people walking around, but I never saw myself that way. I always saw myself as not doing things good enough. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's it's critical the way we perceive ourselves, how it's going to impact our decisions as well. And I loved everything which you said, especially um, the metaphor with, with the bird, right? I think that this is very, very important. And also what you said about body, uh, that body can self-regulate. We don't have to uh, do anything about it. If you all overeat, you're probably going to feel satiated for a longer time. So it seems like a unique binge per brain program worked for you better than some of the other methods you've tried before. So in your opinion, what's so special about like brain-based approach to healing eating disorders that allows people to recover faster and perhaps even with putting less effort into it? Okay. Thank you for that question. And, um, This is what I have known, again, for a very, very long time. And let me uh, just also say that when I was 54 years old, remember, I'm 62, I made a, I had wanted to go away to treatment for a long time, but I thought that, you know, my entire family would fall apart if I went away for 30 days. But finally, in 2014, um, I was standing over my kitchen trash can purging for the, you know, God knows how many times. And I called a girl that I knew from OA who had been away to treatment. Anyway, I went away for 30 days in 2014. I went away again to the same treatment center for 30 days. And I was abstinent when I was there. But when I came home within four months, I think I lost my abstinence. And I remember um, in 2014, somebody had brought brownies to work. And it was late in the afternoon. And I was a little stressed out. And I looked over at the, um, where the brownies were. And I just went over and had one. Well, you know, with, with, with my, what I knew at that point was I've done it, you know, I've kicked off the uh, uh, allergic reaction, you know, blah, blah, blah. 2018, November, I went back for 30 days and I lost my abstinence at the airport. Then I went back again in October of 2021. I was there 30 days, beautiful. And I lost my absence very quickly, but I did find uh, the podcast, Food Junkies podcast, and Natalia, you were a guest host on there. And um, just when you were talking about the neuroscience in the brain, I said, that is it. And we've been working together um, since then, I think early December, but um, oh my gosh, I lost my train of thought. Uh, Oh, learning that. And this is how I explain it again to, because I'm a talker, you know. Learning that if the fight, okay, when that fight or flight response hits my primitive reptilian brain, and it might be something as simple as, oh, those girls um, are snobbing me. And these are girls at work. I'm a grown woman. I'm not a, a high schooler. Well, that thought has hit my brain and I have activated that uh, fight or flight. So those chemicals in my brain are often running. seconds later, when my cognitive brain says, Franny, they're just, you know, talking about a patient. It's too late. The reaction of fight or flight and and that overload of um, overwhelming anxiety has, has been activated. And I, all these years of using food as my um, calming strategy is what led me to pick up a brownie, if you will. Once I accepted and once I saw it written, because this is what I've known all these years, I cannot stop it. I remember once walking over to, um, I was walking to a drugstore to get um, like binge food. And I looked up at the sky and I said, God, I know you're there, but you could strike me dead right now, but you cannot stop me from walking in there and buying a four pound bag of trail mix. And that's the difference today. That's powerful. And especially uh, because, you know, those things happened to you a couple of months ago. So you are still so close and you can properly describe the way it feels like this overwhelming urge and, you know, going to the shop, having that anxiety associated with that. So that's great. I think that uh, that many people can um, can relate. And going back to in general, 
like mindset shift. So before coaching, you believed that you were a food addict who was doomed to struggle with food forever. Now you have such a high belief in yourself. You are more compassionate towards yourself, less self-critical. So how did you make that shift from where you were then and where you are right now? So what kind of limiting beliefs you needed to let go of in order to create more peaceful relationship with food? Well, uh, you have helped me so much, Natalia. And I remember one one of our sessions, it was probably early on, like maybe within the fourth or fifth one. And by the way, I was, I told you this, Natalia, I was not a star student. It's not like I pulled out my workbook that I did print beautifully and I had it bound at the, you know, uh, print store. Uh, and I will hold on to it like my Bible, because um, I do know that uh, there are times when I, I, I will need, I would, I will want not I will, I will want to look back on it. So I've changed some of the narrative in my head, but back to um, the example I was going to cite, I was telling you that I had, I think, stolen some food from a coworker out of the refrigerator, which by the way, that's a behavioral addiction that goes along with my food. I do, uh, you know, I would go in the refrigerator at work and take other people's food if it was expired or something like that. And when I told you, you said, well, you didn't kill anybody. Right. And I'm like, well, no. And, and, you know, then you backed off. You're like, well, did you harm anybody? And I'm, I said, you know, myself, because I felt uh, uh, ashamed and self-loathing and hopeless and remorseful, all of that stuff. And I wrote this down for years. I did a 10th step every night for years and 10th step. If, if uh, those that don't know is when you review, um, uh, your daily things. Was I selfish today? Was I resentful? Was I this? So for me, um, some of that stuff just added to my judgment of myself that I'm selfish, resentful, jealous, and afraid. Okay. Why am I resentful, jealous, selfish, and afraid? That is not the, the meat of me. Those might be little, little things But, you know, again, like I said earlier, I am 85 to 90 percent a damn good person, a damn good person. I'm a good mother. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm cursing. Let me rephrase (laughs) that. I am a I am a I am a good person. And at 62 years old, of course, I'm in the afternoon of my life. I am done judging myself so harshly. And uh that's the difference. I love it. I love it. When you said that, all I wanted to do is just, you know, clap, just applaud you. Yeah, this is this is great. That was the biggest mindset mindset shift I I saw within you. And yeah, that's uh, that's beautiful. That finally you see yourself like, yes, you are a good person. And I've been working with you for such a long time. And I know how caring you are, how supportive you are. But somehow towards yourself, you were very self-critical. Yeah. So I love, I love what you, uh, what you said. Okay. So I love to hear about, you know, uh, how your mindset change. And I know that changing the way we perceive ourselves and the world is one of the easiest way to change your relationship with food Uh, and adjusting your mindset, stopping obsessing about food helped you to be more engaged in life. So I would like to, I would like you to share with us how other areas of your life changed as a result of coaching, for example, your relationship with exercise, rest, um, your creativity, your relationships, and so on. Thank you for that. And um, I would love, love to share this. There are a couple things I want to share. But the first thing is, in all of these decades, I started um, running when I was about 21 years old. I ran two marathons when I was 24 and 26. For the my 30s, 40s, and 50s, and 60s, and up until August, when I walked out of an uh, out of a yoga studio, I have belonged to a gym. I, I'm not obsessive exercise. However, I work just about full time. I work 30 hours a week. I have, you know, t- of course, my children have grown. But anyway, my mother has Alzheimer's, and I am her primary uh, right hand. She's still on her own. But what I want to say is. I spent 
so much of my free time, and when I say free time, time I wasn't working or laundry or cooking or anything, going to that gym, going, I loved my hot yoga. I really did. But I have not belonged to a gym since August when I uh, left. And it has allowed me the freedom to decide I'm going to go outside and walk for 30 minutes. I might get on my elliptical I have at home for maybe 20 or 30 minutes a couple of times a week, but I'm so not obsessed with looking at the clock. I mean, I used to go to a bar class and for somebody who works full time, it's so hard to drive there, go to the class for an hour and a half. And then I like doing so many other things. And here is my, um, what I learned from you as well, Natalia, we can get dopamine and that feeling good chemical in our brain when we engage in stimulating activities. I am sitting to you in my craft room that as uh, empty nesters, we have a, a, you know, an extra bedroom and I turn my music on and I might just be gluing, you know, buttons on a picture frame to make it look different. I'm, I'm not an artist, but I love, love having a different part of my creative brain, just allowing myself to breathe and flow and enjoy life. And I mean, it just, um, it's a different way of thinking and reacting and just being. And I don't look at, try not to look at Facebook, which was not helpful to me because everybody, I I mean, I would talk to a friend who I know is totally miserable, uh, can't go out of her house. But if you were to look at her um, Facebook, you would think this woman is just on top of the world. And anyway, yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you. So I love to hear about all of the areas of your life uh, that changed. And I also love to hear about them, you know, at the beginning of each of our coaching sessions together because you even showed me some of your art projects you've done. I remember you telling me uh, that you spontaneously were dancing with your husband in the kitchen. Yeah, so those are the moments for which binge eating recovery is really worth it and not many people talk about it. So thank you so much. Uh, I think that when your eating disorder shrinks, all of the other areas of your life start thriving. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. And um, and Natalia, I do just want to say one more thing. All these years that I've struggled, my husband is a foodie. He is a foodie. He loves to cook. He loves high quality foods. He loves dessert. My mother is a food hoarder. And so I would jokingly, I told you, I, I have a, I talk all the time. I've never met a stranger, but I'm like, when I get to the pearly gates, I'm going to say, God, why did you put a food addict with a foodie husband and a food hoarder mother? And the things I used to do when I didn't believe in myself, I would buy thrift produce, like especially pears. So if I bought four pairs for a dollar that were half rotten, I would eat all four of them instead of paying $2 for one beautiful one, because that was the value I put on myself. And so that mind shift has changed, you know, as well as, you know, I'm worth it. Yeah. I I also have similar uh, experiences and I, I laughed when you said, you know, about your your husband and about your mother. I mean, I knew about it. I know that this is, uh, in a way, very serious situation. But the way you you mentioned that, it, it's kind of funny. <laughs> but yes. Um, okay. So we are slowly approaching to the end of today's episode. So tell me, is there something you would like to share with the audience? Is there something you would like to say to someone else who had lifelong eating disorder, who was deeply in binging or binging and purging for years or even decades, what would you say to them? What would you like to all binge eaters know about binge eating recovery and the role of, of brain in, the, in that process? Yeah. Do you have any, any tips for the audience? Anything comes to your mind? Well, the one thing I would really like to say, and you have said this to me, Natalia, is that I'm not broken. 
And I would like to say that to anybody listening, you know, when I struggle or struggled, I always thought that it was my fault that there is something wrong with me, but I am a 100% perfect me. Now, are there things in my life I'd like to improve? Yes. If I look at my garden, okay, uh, there might be a few weeds in there. Maybe I want to change the uh, shape of the flower bed a little bit. That doesn't mean it is not what it is. And we are all, we are all human beings. All of our chemists, just like we all have two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. None of us look identical unless you're, you know, an identical twin. And that tells me that my exact DNA, my exact chemistry in my brain, I have, I want to honor that. And notice I stopped saying have, have to honor that because I don't have to do anything. I want to honor that. I want to believe in the gut, the light that is in me and working with you and your program has allowed me, has given me the opportunity to accept the fact that I've known all along, but it was a little whisper that I'm okay. Okay, I'm not broken. Um, I might not be flawless uh, in the eyes of anyone other than myself, but you know what? I still believe in myself. And when I look deep in my eyes in the mirror, I have to believe in who I am. It, yeah, it's it's amazing. I really regret that we don't have recorded our first conversation like before coaching it's such a massive shift in the way you talk about yourself yeah that's uh, that's really impressive <laughs> okay so i'm grateful for having this conversation with you today as i watched you change and grow i was like people need to hear this so thank you so much franny for having the courage to come on the show and share your story in hopes for helping other women around the world to feel a little less alone in their journey i love you and i'm sure that you stole our audience's heart as well (laughs) oh thank you so much thank you so much natalia and it's so funny because i asked you in the beginning how old you were and my eating disorder uh, you know, my struggles with food, excuse me, I'm going to quit uh, calling myself, uh, I'm going to work on that mind shift, but uh, it, my my struggles with food are older than you are. So um, <laughs> I respect you tremendously. And I think you're very, you have a way of explaining what our brain is doing, which is what has helped me so, so much with your training and your, your education and your experience. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm really happy with, with our, um, yeah, with our work together. So thank you so much again for coming on the show and thank you to all listeners for joining us. Have a great rest of your day. Bye. Bye. If you enjoyed today's episode and you would like to stay in touch with me, make sure to follow Pinch Proof Brain on Instagram. And if you are ready to take this material to the next level and apply what you've learned, then go ahead and submit your application for my Pinch Proof Brain coaching program. Thank you so much for joining me today and have a great day.